<laughs> so the Russians are talking about deorbiting the ISS in 2020. Um, I just wanted to see if we could throw out some ideas about what parts of that station can be salvaged, reused, um, and not drop the whole thing into the ocean. Yeah, so actually, uh, this is really interesting to me because I was uh, thinking about this recently. And, uh, you know, the reason they set 2020 is because that's the end of life for most of the materials that are built up there. You know, the batteries, power systems, a lot of stuff they can't replace now that the shuttle's done. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, what would it take to really be able to repair some of the items that are reaching end of life that could be swapped out? Um, what can be rated, you know, uh, extended during that time in order to, you know, maybe increase it, increase the, the timeline to 2030. And then, again, you're saying, what can we use it for? Um, my first thought was, why not tourism? Why not bring people up there and have them stay? It's a really big station. You know, you can uh, still do a lot of good science experiments up there. There's, you know, no real reason that it just has to be American and, and Russian, you know, some uh, European space agency astronauts using it. Right. I, and and I, I was reading this morning before I came over that, the Russians are actually talking about taking their modules and detaching them from the ISS and using it as a core for a subsequent station, since they've got some of the, the newest modules that are up there. And, and it seems that they've designed their modules to be more conducive to, you know, in order to prepare. Now, how possible is it to disassemble on orbit now? Is there is there a way to take apart some of the modules and attach them to another new vehicle that has some of the new hardware? I, I think the uh, ISS has a better job Year to year of addressing the problems of having cables reaching through hatches is that they, they end up having a, a large diameter docking hatch, and then you've got smaller doors going in between. And in the annular space in between there, they put short cables, which were going from bulkhead fitting to bulkhead fitting. So you could close the hatches and not have cables reaching through the hatch. So it should be possible to go in there, you know, power down the module, disconnect all, all those cables, and then close the hatches and disengage. So it would be, you know, it would take a couple of days of work on it to make sure you got all your I's dotted and T's crossed. It should be possible to disconnect some of these things without having immense problems. Now some of them, almost all the modules have their own power supply, but some don't. And those, you know, you would have to shut them down completely. They'd have to go dark. You'd have no light support inside them. And then some other vehicle would have to tow them away. Or it doesn't have a temporary battery pack for the transfer. Or you yeah. find design. Yeah, yeah just, it, just attach a small solar array to it so that it's got hotel power to keep stuff going. Or you, you, you dock essentially a light support vehicle to it, you know, which provides the electrical power. So, but it would take a lot of engineering effort to figure out, okay, well, because it's all custom stuff. If there's not an off-the-shelf orbital transfer vehicle that you can just use to fly up there, dock with it, and fly away. And the other problem is using space station is that it's expensive to maintain. You've got to have reboost propellant and all sorts of light support gear and spare parts for all the stuff that's wearing down. Because again, it was all custom engineered stuff. It wasn't off-the-shelf. So you can't buy the replacement parts cheap from, like, you know, aircraft supply company. And, you know, the smart way to do it would have been to give it a 440 AC power supply that would use standard aircraft avionics that wouldn't have required any new, new engineering. But they went with, like, a 1,000 cycles per second AC power system. Yeah, that was and, you know, they, they did all this custom engineering in ISS because, you know, we're NASA and we're going to do it, you know, our unique way instead of saying, what can we just buy off the shelf? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a typical problem with the pork, the pork barrel project, which is ISS was. So unlike some uh, future space hotel that uh, could be built a little more modular, um, well, a little more standardized, I guess you can say, um, the space station itself is, it has designed yeah. from the start to not be able to support that. It, it, they, they've got um, equipment racks that are double wide rather than being a standard 19 inch equipment rack. They came up with their own double wide rack. Now you can buy off the shelf double wide 19 inch rack stuff. But now.
NASA didn't go with that standard. No, they came up with a new one. And you see this time and time and time again throughout all the engineering of the system on the space station is that it was all unique stuff. It's all not invented here attitude, which would make it hideously expensive to use. Actually, the best use I can think of for ISS is for asteroid land. Consider it to be an asteroid, which has already had the metals refined, you know, it's got aluminum and silicon and stuff, <laughs> and you just take it apart. And because trying to maintain the stuff, it's like, you know, you see, I work at Mojave. They got the boneyard out there with the old aircraft that are not worth maintaining anymore. And they took off the, the valuable parts, the engines and the landing gear and some of the AVIs that get recycled and the vehicles that maintain similar age ones that need to keep going. But after that, is that all you've got is uh, a new batch of beer cans and you take it apart. But you know, there's hundreds of tons of material out there that's just as mass is useful stuff. And then once you've got materials processing in orbit, then you can use the decommissioned ISS as a really conveniently placed asteroid. But then it's only convenient if like 51 point six degrees. Yeah, but if you, if you hook up a, an electrodynamic tether to it, you can, over the course of a couple of years, change its orbit plane, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not an insurmountable problem. Let me just throw one thing in. Boeing just got a contract to investigate what it would take to extend the life beyond 20 degrees. Yeah. Well, what would it Nobody knows yet. The contract's working. The yeast is fairly dry. Well, it sounds a sure thing that 2020 was going to be the end. I mean, so this is the first I've heard that we're going to have one. They wanted to extend it to at least 2020 and possibly beyond. They weren't saying we're going to splash it in 2020. But my question is so, do we really want the space station to be there for like 30 years? Like the shuttle lasted 30 years and didn't. Oh, well, we have an asset up there, right? You know, we have we have hardware up there that we can use in the future. And you know, if it, I know it's, they're saying end of life is twenty twenty, but a lot of those parts are built with you know a factor yeah, large double factor of safety. Yeah, well, not so, everything went up in the nineties. I mean, some of it was, was fairly new. That's true. true. A lot of yeah, it was fairly new. I mean, the rough. So my point is, it's uh, <coughs> it's very expensive, like we have seen, and uh, maybe after thirty years, twenty thirty years, maybe we should do something. Well, but when it's it's more sure. a lot of the, a lot of the money has been invested in ISS because um, most of the money is involved in building the modules and sending it up there, and there isn't there is money involved in like keeping it up, like sending crew up there and stuff. That's that's true. But you're going to have that with whatever vehicle or with whatever is up there, whatever destination is up there. You're going to have costs associated with that. ISS, by and large, at this point, is the costs have been the costs have been put up there. If you were to boost it high enough and just shut everything down on the ground, it would cost you nothing. It would stay. I mean, first you have to boost it high enough, but it would cost you nothing if it would stay. Because it would be right. Well, most yeah. of nothing. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you boost it up high enough, it ends up in the Van Allen belts and the, and the solar arrays get trashed by the radiation belts. Okay. And yeah, the entire thing gets a little bit. Can, can, they, can they pass through the VA belts or? Say again? Can, can it pass through? It just can't probably, sit there. You probably for, can't put enough acceleration on it to get it through, get fast it through in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Especially if you're using like an electrodynamic tether so that you don't have to send ton, hundreds of tons of reaction mass up there. Because that's expensive too. Mm -hmm. but, uh, By the time you look at moving the space station anywhere substantially different from where it is now, you're investing so much in, in just the propulsion side of that operation. That you really want to put that investment onto a new space station that's designed for what you're going to do with it. Well, so consider, I mean, you can take, you can use it for maybe not life support, but use all the, the capabilities of the power. There's so many solar arrays, it's what, two megawatts of power? You can uh, use it as a big power station up there. A few hundred kilowatts. A few hundred kilowatts? Well, that's, that's more than yeah, anything else the, we have up the, there. The solar arrays are, are one of the things that would be worth salvaging. What about the, you know, the pressure vessels? I mean, those things are, that's a good pressure vessel up there. Well, that's a yes and no, because the thing that dies first is all the seals. Yep. You know, yeah. These polymer seals, and uh, mm. you get 10 years out of one, you're doing well. But what about the backbone structure itself that, that supports the arrays? I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, it's an aluminum, I think, an aluminum mm -hmm. composite structure. It's aluminum. Aluminum. Yeah. 
And the, and the degradation of the arrays, still 10% for 10 years? I've been out of the business for 20 plus years. I worked for you for a while. It's, well, it's possible to um, rejuvenate the arrays if you, if you go over them with something that just heats up the cells right. to anneal them and get rid of the, some of the dislocations and stuff. So you can you replace the, the arrays themselves and keep the supporting structure that aligns uh, it. That would be maintenance and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be excellent. Yeah. Supporting yeah. structure isn't that expensive in the end. Uh, you, you could send up a, a not very large device that would just be an infrared laser that would paint the cells one at a time and anneal them. You know, it might take a couple of weeks to process all of them, but you could rejuvenate the, the solar array and get more life out of it. But that's a science project in itself. Well, the other thing is, like those solar arrays, they're space based solar, they're space rated solar arrays, so they're still going to have pretty good efficiency even as they degrade. Well, it, um, it, it, it just depends it, on how much how much power you want. Mm -hmm. So but what can you live with? It's yeah. Like, you know, is that the, the cost is low. You just take them over and put them onto a new space station. But uh, you know, they're incredibly delicate structures too. It's hard to hard to handle and move them. And they were not designed to be rolled back on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Is that zip tie fix? <laughs> You're going to move them, you're going to move them just like they are. And some kind of ion drive would be the easy way to do it. You haven't got a whole lot of... Yeah, but uh, it's just got power, power right there. Yeah. You, you need, and, and, you need there was another question I was going to ask. Was, was ion drive for the station itself, will that buy us a few years? Or you got the power, you're going to be a way of dealing with the reboots problem. Right? I mean, yeah. G3R, ion drive didn't work out quite so well. 10-year spacecraft lasted 14 months. Ion drive, well, actually, look for a at, at Vesta. It's, yeah. been work, it's been grinding away for years. It's going to spend a year at Vesta and then another year or two getting over to series and another year there. Okay. And the other thing to look at is Hall Effect thrusters, which are similar to ion thrusters, but operationally have proven uh, much more robust. Uh, they've been used for years on, on ComSats. Yeah. Okay. This is well established at this point. The real big question is what are you going to power it with? To me, the answer is just obvious. You get up to yourself a little atomic furnace and go to it. Yeah. Well, for just reboost, for just reboost, uh, a small fraction of that 100 kilowatts of yeah. array you've already got there to do the job. Right. Um, are they ever going to put that Vasimir on there, or is that just BS? The what? Uh, the Vasimir. The Vasimir. Uh, yeah, that is something Vasimir. Ad Astra, I think it's a company now, it really wants to do it because it's the only realistic way for them to test their thruster. And that's probably made in its own right, which I can get this afternoon if anybody wants. Um, it needs to be tested in space, and ISS is the place to do that right now. ISS doesn't get much making out of it. They're not planning on using it as their reboot. I've heard a little bit about it. Can you explain more about the Vesmer? Uh, why don't I make a full talk about that? Yeah. Like, okay. I'm yeah. just easy but I mean, like, I, I mean, the Vasmer has been proven at least to produce thrust. Uh, actually, it has not. That's why it's thrust. But I, I saw that video <laughs> where with that little the, the puck, and it gets knocked back by the. It's done by Disney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always a little bit of fine print. We have produced something that, if the following assumptions hold true, would equate to 300 milliliters of thrust. Okay. Uh, there's always fine print, and it's not any fault of their own. It's just that really needs to be tested in space. It's, it's inherent in the physics of how the Vasmer works. It's Damn difficult to test it on the ground. You can't make a big ground. But that does bring up one thing that ISS would be useful for is just a general test bed for things that should be tested in space. Because for a long time, even after its nominal decommissioning day, it will be possible for a few good mechanics to keep it minimally habitable. Yeah, so that you might do it man intended instead of having people living on board, you would visit it every few months to change out experiments. And that would be great from the point of view of microgravity experiments without having the people bouncing around and bumping and shaking the thing up. Yeah. Just getting the people off board would make it more useful for the kinetic testing. Mm -hmm. and, and I missed the beginning. At this point, the end of life that they're talking about is that 20 to 2025, 2020, 2025 range. Yeah. That's end of NASA funding. It's when it will be hard to maintain the thing. And it is, like he said, uh, the seals on the pressure vessels for the life support are the, probably the long haul in that can because... They are life limited and they're really hard to replace once you've built it. Okay. But, but, but like, it will actually start to lose atmosphere then? It will, it will make, the leak rate will just continuously increase. And eventually, 
actually it won't be worth the trouble of trying to ship up makeup gas faster. Uh, what is the leak rate right now? Is it is there is it, it's not zero, I assume, yeah. right? Many kilograms per day. I, I, on the order of a kilogram per day Whoa. is that wow. the current nominal and like I said, it's gonna get worse. Cool. It may be many kilograms at this point, I don't know. And, and, and they, they, weren't, they weren't able to use metal to metal seals? No. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they don't seal well enough. For some things, they, I'm certain they did, but there are other places where you can put it in. And particularly anything that's going to have to be open and closed like a hatch. Mm -hmm. So what about private companies being interested? I mean, if, if Bigelow is interested in a hotel in space, can that, could he... Tether a couple of his modules to yeah, that. piggyback it on, use the power from and use the power grid in solar rays. It, it might be that Bigelow would park one of their systems a few miles away. Sure. And keep the co-orbital. The, uh, the inherent in having people on board all the time and having an efficient life support system is that you're electrolyzing condensate water or urine water to uh, create oxygen. You get hydrogen at the same time. You use a portion of the oxygen for breathing, and the rest of the oxygen and all the hydrogen ends up being used in small hot gas thrusters. And it turns out that just with the water that people are producing by metabolizing food and the power that it takes to reduce that to oxygen, you, oh, by the way, get all your orbital makeup just from the excess oxygen, hydrogen and the oxygen, a portion of the oxygen. So you ship food up to the uh, space station, and that gets metabolized. And when you electrolyze the water that's part of that food, you get the oxygen food needs as well. So you only have to ship a little bit of nitrogen to make up for over the leakage. And if there's enough protein in the food, and you're decomposing the, uh, the, the waste products from that, that supplies your nitrogen as well. So the food is, is all the expendables that you need to send up. Yeah. You, know, okay. it's, you just got to send up the right stuff. Yeah. No, but that's what that's what Bigelow was working for. Yeah. 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 He's going up to mining the, uh, the uh, solar panels and the them off. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he'd want the space unit. The tether people have been trying to solve the problem. Interest the customer in having a tether there as a peak power device. So that you're ordinarily putting energy from the solar arrays into the tether to keep climbing slowly. And then when you need a whole bunch of power, you just do dynamic braking using the tether. And that can produce you know, hundreds of kilowatts of power huh. off of a, you know, like a 50 foot long tether. And that way you can get, it's, it's better than having batteries. You're storing the energy and the kinetic energy in the space station which is a far nice. higher energy density than any batteries could possibly be. Just like breaking in a Prius. It's the biggest flywheel. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. to clear up a misperception, a someone mentioned Bigelow <laughs> being a <laughs> hotel. Mm -hmm. And Bigelow's market is not anything about hotels, even though he used to own a bunch of motels. It's, sovereign. it's all about sovereign uh, uh, access, if you want to think of it as a timeshare laboratory. Because his customers are six or seven countries right now. And and Singapore, Abu Dhabi, uh, United Arab Emirates, um, and a few others. So, so in other words, not people without money. They're, they're, these are people with money. They're people with money who've Con already signed up. I think the Netherlands is one of them. But I mean, clearly there will be personal vis personal space like visitors to the places. But the big market is a sovereign market. For fifty million dollars a year, you can have your own manned space flight space station program. And oh, and by the way, that so includes it's great for national prestige. Yeah. And that, you know, it's not just in America that people are trying to push STEM, the you know, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics yeah. education. I mean, if you've got your own space station in what used to be a second world country, mm -hmm. you know, what that does for national prestige and for firing up students to, to perform higher, that's you know, a lot of governments are gonna go, man, that's a worthwhile bargain. And of course, Explorer wants to eventually provide the taxi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, we actually did, uh, speaking of, we actually did a, a study for uh, some people in the UAE that uh, demonstrated that um, in the Lynx or in the Virgin Galactic uh, Spaceship 2, you could actually uh, have every single eighth grader in Abu Dhabi in teams of five 
doing a real space flight experiment only some orbital vehicles for under $10 million a year. And they're like, oh my goodness, that's yeah. nothing. That's like a rounding error on a rounding error. Permission slip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So, you know, Sorry, you weren't born in the right country. $35 for a year. Yeah. I mean, they vent that much natural gas in a day. Well. <laughs> so it's, with the going coming back to ISS and in its uses after 2020, I think you can salvage some components and recycle others. And you know, one of the things you most desperately need in orbit is a foundry and machine shop. Because once you can melt down, recast, and remachine, because there's there's thousands of tons of aluminum in orbit right now. And between the, uh, I don't know if you might have heard of Eddie, Electrodynamic Degree Eliminator, it's from uh, a Tethers company, I can't remember which one, Joe Carroll is in, in, involved with it. And Joe Carroll and his company, whichever it is, both companies have the name Tethers in it, and I can't remember which is what. Um, they've actually flown multiple Tethers in space, uh, sometimes with a Delta, as a, as a secondary payload and so on. And, um, the eddy is a slowly spinning tether with electrodynamic ability. It can climb and descend and change orbit plane. And they've got their analytical model showing that a fleet of just 12 of these vehicles over a period of seven years will be able to clear out like 95% of the debris in Earth orbit right now. And what does it do with the debris? It, um, it has basically a net on the end of it. It's very lightweight because the acceleration at the end of this very slowly spinning tether is like a thousandth of a G. It's a big butterfly. And it thing. captures the thing. And then it can bring it down to a lower altitude very quickly and easily by dissipating energy. And either deliver it to a depot where it's just capturing all these lumps of junk in one spot, where a single tether can maintain their orbit, or just bring them down low enough so that aerodynamic drag can take it out of orbit. You're basically describing Norton sails in space. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. And um, they're trying to get the Russians interested in it because most of the uh, mass in orbit is spent upper stages from Soviet launches. And technically, all that stuff still belongs to the successor country of Russia. And so there's no open salvage. You know, we can turn this into we'll a valuable asset for you that you can resell to other people. And you know, all we ask is a small percentage of the take, hmm. and that you know gives that makes it possible for the, for the tether company to raise the funding to build these things and you know do the first one just as a demo. But uh, you know, inside of a decade, you could clear out ninety some odd percent of the, of the crud up there, prevent cascade failures where you get multiple collisions and just making more small debris. You know, you're doing well by doing good. Are you talking salvaging parts as opposed to just uh, bring them to a lower orbit to uh, let them burn up? The, the, you, the yeah. Both are possible. Kind of a different story. And you know, bringing them to a depot because there's there's a couple of hundred old upper stages for like from Soyuz and Salyut launch and uh, Proton launches, and you know they're known quantities is that they 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 were a production run of, of hundreds. And so you could take those to a given spot and just, you know, cut them up into pieces to use for radiation shielding on something else, for instance, on a manned station. You know, that's the simplest reuse of those components. This, this panel, which we know exactly what it's going to look like and do because we have blueprints and all of it, combined times 40 or 50 launchers can build, you know, well, so again, you why know, we manufacture where you simply reuse yeah. a component. You have huge liquid oxygen tanks, which we assume are vacuum tight, and you know you can only do the um, wet work shell thing. Dial up with some plugs. Mm -hmm. with there is again the seals issue that you have to look at. Yeah. But mm -hmm. You might have useful pressure vessels. You might have useful rocket engines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those engines do not get anywhere near their rate of life. Yeah. Again, seals. Yeah. But and actually, the skins on a lot of that stuff is very thin, and micrometeor damage is probably not airtight anymore. Where some of the stuff that's been up there for decades, you know, probably has more than a few small holes in it. Yeah. Put the base metal. Bring your patch in. Round it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much of the stuff in Geo is, is operational? How much is it? Yeah, sure. Um, so the back. Yeah, I can't find it. 
far lower than this one was in the wheel. It's kind of it's expensive to get up there. And, um, and it is at that low range concentration. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, it's hard to do electrodynamic maneuvering up there, so it would cost you a lot of reaction mass. The beautiful thing about everything below about 2,000 kilometers is you can get around with a tether. It just takes you time on electric power from solar power. And uh, the, the remarkable thing is their, their proposal was that these 12 tethers would collectively weigh just a couple of tons. Uh, I mean, you could do it on one launch. You could deploy the entire system of multiple tethers, and they would go out there and solve the problem. You said they won't work at higher altitudes because of uh, lack of magnetic field? There? They, they, there's less magnetic field, and there's less ionosphere there. Is there any value in boosting the, the ISS just to have it as, an, as a static display of human civilization, like a museum piece? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, seriously, like, I mean, it's, look at what we did up there, look at this huge thing, and, and, and let everybody can look up and see it pass overhead, you know, when it comes by, instead of just yeah, throwing over. Yeah, I'm hoping that by 2020, we'll have much brighter things to look at. Artificial <laughs> reading, we're not much longer than that. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned something in passing, and the STS-135 tweet up, we had a, a, um, a demonstration for an on-orbit service robot, basically, for, for geosatellites refueling mission. How feasible is that? Is that something that, you know, how much of a pipe dream was? I don't know. Lucky and Boeing are both working on one, so uh, okay. I wouldn't say it's unfeasible. <laughs> uh, we're now of time. So, just want to let, to let everyone know. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. No, it's an interesting talk. I mean,